Welcome to the audio fiction podcast, The History Singer, written, produced, and voiced by me, your host, Jan Nichols. You should know that the story is told in sequential order, so start with 101 and carry on. Also, The History Singer is written in changing first-person narrative. From time to time, you'll hear me say a character's name. That's your cue that the following section is from that person's perspective. And now, our story continues. Toby Grace I stared at the river. As always, I felt myself falling toward the water, as if from a great height. I resisted the urge to jump in as I pulled off my stockings and boots. I didn't mind wet clothes, but squishing my way back to camp in wet socks was unappealing. The water was cold. I could feel the ice melt of winter snow, resisting the season's turn towards spring. I wanted to yell for the joy of it, but my mangled tongue would only allow an animal grunting that shamed me. So I slipped below the water's surface, inhale and yell, repeat again and again. I think I had always been able to breathe underwater. Ariante and I had learned to swim early. We paddled and played in streams and rivers all across Nerth as the ladies' players traveled the known lands. Ariante could sing long and complicated phrases on a single breath, but I could always hold my breath longer underwater. One time, my foot got caught in a tangle of river weed, and I held my breath for so many ticks I lost count. I don't remember being afraid. After a while, I inhaled, as normal as normal can be. It felt like I was home. Not that I knew anything about having a home, except for Ariante. Most people at the holdings and towns where the troupe performed talked about home as a place. Like breathing underwater, being in company with Ariante was real when everything else felt distant. I've never told her about my ability, not that I think she'd mind, soon as she got used to the idea. It's just something special that's mine alone, like the river-washed pebble of interesting shape and color that I keep in the inner pocket of my waistcoat. A secret reminder of what I can do. Even if I don't know where I came from, when it comes down to it, I'm not a sharing kind of person. Being mute is useful that way. Besides, I like listening learning what people would rather keep hidden. I surfaced to float on my back, watching the sun work its way through a cloud bank. I could always think better in the water, and I was finally ready to think about what happened between Ariante and me. Her touch felt like a lightning strike. The overwhelming urge to pull her close and be rough about it frightened me. She was my sister, not by blood, but of the heart. But in that moment, I thought nothing of her. I felt only the need to touch and taste and consume her. I fled to the river not because my feelings shocked me, but because the feelings had always been there, part of who I am, like breathing underwater. After the sun had passed the tops of the trees, I swam to the bank and sat in the sun to let my clothes dry. I could hear Ariante singing. Her voice was odd like that. It carried over long distances, catching a ride on the wind in a way I didn't understand. The song was simple, a lullaby, I think. I sat listening for the longest while until the song suddenly stopped. Xander and Bikanyi. I cursed the girl's silence. I told you to keep singing. The decomp stared, unblinking at us. Shuffling a step closer, it signed a single word, song. The girl stood tall and spoke with a surprising air of authority. Who are you? She hissed. Turning to point at the decomp, she asked, Is he with you? She sounded angry, but not at all unnerved by the impossibility of encountering a living dead person. 
but I could see that her hands trembled in spite of holding them stiff and splayed against her tunic. This isn't a time for courtly introductions, my lady, I said. But as you refuse to sing, the one thing that might prevent our blood being spilled, I am Xanderin Bikanyi, envoy of the benevolent and the scalded bane, presently serving at the capital city, Renatus. At your service. I bowed with a mock flourish, my sword hand never losing touch with my weapon. In answer to your question, I generally prefer my traveling companions to be among the living, but the silence might be an appealing alternative unless, perhaps, your ladyship is ready to fulfill the request of our guest and sing. Her eyes narrowed as she took stock of me. I wore a black tunic, quilted at the chest and across the top of my shoulders. Fine-spun leggings closed the gap between my knee-length travel tunic and my black boots of fine leather. I felt as if I were a junior officer under review and found lacking. I could feel the heat of anger surging up from the pit of my stomach to flush my neck and face. No doubt, she saw that too. Without thinking, I shifted to a fighting stance, body angled to protect the major organs one hand tightening its grip on my broadsword, the other now holding her arm. The girl tried to shake off my hand, but turned to wretch instead, as a breeze enveloped us in the overpowering stench of death. The decomp stood grown man high, stoop-shouldered and bone-thin with ashy skin. As he turned to face me, I saw the awful reality. One eye socket was empty, filled with maggots that spilled down his cheek in a squiggly line. The face was corrupt, jawbone showing through bruised green flesh. The eye that remained stared at me unblinking. Its mirror-like appearance revealed it as a tech implant of some sort. His long-fingered hands were delicate, skimpy flesh barely covering the bones beneath. Distracted by the long fingernails that reached talon-like toward us, the girl stumbled over the words. You, you're communicating, she said, trying to make sense of a walking dead man who spoke the dancing hand's language. Who are you? No reply, just the same sign, again and again. Song. You, you want me to sing, she stammered. For the love of all the gods, old and new, will you not sing? My voice was low and calm, but my teeth were clenched. All right, she said, though I wasn't clear if she spoke to me or the decom. All right, I'll sing. A dancing jig, perhaps, or a tarantella. No, no, that's no good. You might come apart completely, and I... I might too. We need something quiet, soothing, something to calm us. She glanced at me, taking note that my sword was partially out of its scabbard. She must have decided that I was the lesser threat as she turned to face the decom. Who are you? By sweet Orfeo, keeper of mysteries, what are you? That's when her stomach rebelled. She doubled over to bring forth her morning meal. Porridge, I think. Followed by a watery bile that must have scalded the back of her throat. She moaned in spite of herself, swallowing back the fear that looked out through her green-flecked hazel eyes. He, it, was standing again. Fingers flying, bones showing, song, song, song. I didn't realize it was the girl's voice at first. It sounded strange, so small and tender, all bird wings and new feathers. 
She was singing a song I didn't remember, yet seemed to recognize. It was a lullaby. Nonsense words and only four ascending tones that returned to the second in a pattern that ebbed and flowed, a tide that came and went with comforting anticipation. She wiped foul spittle from the corner of her mouth, stood taller, and continued to sing. Her audience of one backed away step by step, signing the nonsense words of the song. She sang long after he was out of sight. At some point, the song became words. It's all right, she said, rocking her upper body back and forth, swaying as the decomp had. It's all right. I'm all right. Everything is all right. She turned to me saying, there's nothing right about singing to a dead man thing. She shuddered, unable to stop. With one intruder gone, she stared at me. I knew what she saw. A man just above average height, strong in sinew and bone, expression storm cloud grim. I let go of her arm to unclasp my cloak of costly synth fiber and draped it around her shoulders. She murmured a thank you, but continued to look at me, assessing if I were a threat. I could feel my lips tighten into a thin line. I was never one to smile over much. Somehow gravity always seemed to tug the corners of my mouth downward. Paired with my gray eyes and the dark brown of my close-cropped hair, my sour look was useful. Flinty dead fish eyes and a grim look intimidated bullies made brave by too much drink, and it discouraged foolish courtiers from engaging me in conversation. Most of the time... The girl finally looked away. She observed her shaking hands as if they belonged to someone else. I cleared my throat, feeling awkward for reasons unknown to me. My lady, I began, but she interrupted me straightway. I am not a lady, she murmured. Her face was deathly pale, and she swayed as a breeze that kicked up out of the northwest stirred her tunic. I took her upper arm again, thinking she was about to faint. The court women of Renatus would have fainted dead away at the sight of a decomp. I could not imagine their rouged lips actually singing to one of the awakened. The girl pulled away, stumbling into a dead oak branch that gouged a V-shaped cut above her right eyebrow. Blood was everywhere, running through the fingers of her hand, useless in staunching the flow. Except for a muttered oath, I remained silent. I led her to the riverbank, helped her sit on the flat rock, and began washing the cut with a steady and practiced hand. I've seen worse, I said. That's not very comforting, she said. Her hand reached up as if to touch the pulsing tick in my jaw, then dropped to her lap. I grunted a reply and went about my work. Picking up a river-worn stone, I pounded moss into a stringy green goo that I applied to the gouge, slowing the stream of blood that ran down her cheek. I pulled clean linen from my overvest and wrapped it around her head, careful not to pull the reddish-brown strands of her hair into the knot. You aren't going to faint, are you? I asked. You look... I have never fainted and I'm not going to start now. To prove her point, the girl stood up suddenly, then lurched into my chest. Embarrassed, she pulled away. I'm just a little dizzy, that's all. 
And what did you mean about the way I look? If I were a swearing man, which you obviously are, she interrupted, I'd say you look like bloody hell. Your absence of good manners is quite astonishing, she said. How do you know I'm a traveling entertainer, or anything else for that matter, she asked. She didn't try to mask her anger. I rather liked it. She speaks truly with none of the veiled slurs or simpering lies of the capital's elite. You haven't even asked my name, she said. Trembling, the girl sat on the rock where I had recently dressed her wound. She looked shaky, bone-chilled, and furious all at once. You are Ariante Grace, I said, a member of the ladies' players, whom I have been sent to serve as escort as you make your way to Vrenholm. I sensed movement about thirty strides away from our position. Weight forward, with my knees slightly bent, I unsheathed my broadsword. No! The girl screamed as she stood up on unsteady legs. Her fingers were a blur as she signed to someone in the dancing hand's language. But she was too slow. I sensed more than saw the knife flying end over end. Someone had thrown a dagger, aiming for where I had stood moments before. The place where the girl was standing now. Toby Grace. No! My yell was a mumbled cry as I ran toward Ariante. By the blessed braid, I have killed her! I thought. No, no, no! I said it to myself over and over. A prayer, a wail, probably both. When I reached Ariante, the stranger was bending over her. I closed the distance between us, throwing myself on his back, my short knife at his throat. But before I could cut him, the man rammed the back of his head into my nose. My grip on the knife loosened, and he forced it from me, twisting my fingers, pointing backward toward my body. He stood and pulled me up, bending my wrist until it locked down the bones in my forearm and shoulder. I was helpless, and the man knew it. I am not your enemy, he signed. Help me with the girl. That's when I dared to actually look at Ariante. She was lying on her side, blood pooling around her head, and from the smell of it, she had been sick. I dropped to my knees. The blood from my broken nose dripped to mingle with Ariante's blood. The stranger gently rolled Ariante to her back, looking for a knife wound. There was a superficial cut on her upper right arm, but not enough to account for all of the blood. Support her head, he signed, cupping his hands to show what he wanted. Try not to shake her to death with your trembling, he added. He looked at me so I could read his lips, but his face was a neutral mass. Cupping Ariante's head in my hands, I inhaled sharply. A sizable gash just below the crown of her head was the source of the blood. This needs to be stitched. The stranger tore the remains of a fine handkerchief into strips, and working together we bound Ariante's wound. Xanthes to me, he called the biggest steed I had ever seen. The stranger cupped his hands and tilted his head toward the mount. I obliged placing my left foot into his hands for a boost into the saddle. Speaking quietly to the stallion, he turned to scoop up Ariante and place her side saddle in front of me. 
Ariante's head lolled against my shoulder, blood leaking from the makeshift bandage to soak my shirt. The stranger didn't speak, but indicated with a curt motion that I should hold Ariante to keep her on the beast he called Xanthes. My arms were already wrapped around her, but it felt like an order. I didn't like it. I returned to camp, created an uproar. All six of the little men crowded round the horse. The hard cider on their breath made my eyes sting. Demos, the fire-breathing strongman, took Ariante from my arms, as if she were a fledgling fallen from the nest. Lotus and Luna swept aside the little men with graceful ferocity to hold Ariante's hand and feel her brow for fever. Soba, who was grinding green peppercorns, stood with an easy grace that did not reflect her age. By the great braids of the weaver, she cried, running to Ariante. So much blood, she murmured, sounding shocked. Soba looked at me, eyeing my bloody nose and the gob of blood on my shirt. Not mine, I signed. Ariante's. Well, that's a mercy. She exhaled sharply and got down to business. I'll tend that nose of yours shortly. Now be a good lad and fetch those water buckets and put some water on the boy. As I ran back to the river, it occurred to me that Soba hadn't even glanced at the stranger. Then I thought of Ariante and ran faster than I had ever run before. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I have a small ask. To make it easy for you or your friends to follow the show, just use this link. It goes like this. Follow the podcast.com backslash history singer. That's it. Easy. Also, if you'd like to leave a rating and review to help others discover the show, I have an easy link for that, too. Simply go to lovethepodcast.com backslash history singer. You know, I thought I made this podcast for me because I felt compelled to tell this story. Now, I realize I really made it for you.